Okay, now let's talk about HIPAA and HIPAA compliance. Now the acronym for HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act. Now it's very important that you learn the acronym and what it means and stands for. These could be on the exam. Now here's a little history of HIPAA. HIPAA became a law in 1996. It was instituted to protect health care information. It was made to improve the delivery of health care and to protect the consumer's private health care information. HIPAA legislation assists in the ability to obtain health coverage, the reduction in the possibility of losing health insurance if an employee loses or leaves a job, the continuance of health care coverage when changing jobs, the continuance of health care coverage if they were insured under a group umbrella, limiting pre-existing health condition exclusions by insurance providers, prohibiting group plans from denying coverage or increasing coverage costs based on an individual's past or present illness, the renewal of insurance regardless of patient's history, more efficient use of medical information, the reduction of fraud and abuse in health insurance, the protection of patient privacy in relation to health care records and treatment. Now, HIPAA does not guarantee low-cost insurance. Now, let's talk about the three phases of HIPAA compliance, electronic data interchange, privacy, and security. Now, electronic data interchange has to do with two healthcare agencies transmitting patient information back and forth. Now, this also includes emails with attachments that would include pertinent patient information. Now, faxes are not considered electronic documents. Privacy has to do with more of chart information, uh, sign-in sheets that require personal information on a patient, uh, speaking about patient's information in public that, does, that should not be spoken. Uh, anything that deals with your computer screen being vulnerable to be looked at and read from outside uh, individuals by not having a screen protector or maybe having it turned a certain way where it's not uh, concealing uh, patient data. These are all part of privacy. Now security has to do with more with password protection, firewall protection, as well as locked cabinets and drawers that contain uh, patient private information in there. This is all part of the three phases of HIPAA compliance. Now the documents required for HIPAA compliance are notice of privacy practices. This informs the patient of the use of confidential information by the healthcare provider. It also addresses the patient's rights regarding confidential information. Also authorization forms. If a healthcare professional must disclose information other than billing, payment, or patient treatment, the practice must obtain signed authorization from patient. Then also business associate agreements. Healthcare providers need to establish an agreement with transcription services or copy services, not necessarily between provider to provider or health insurance providers. Another requirement is a HIPAA policy manual. Each provider must create a manual describing policies and procedures as they relate to patient information. Non-compliance. Serious penalties exist for the healthcare providers who are not in compliance with HIPAA. Consists of monetary and or imprisonment. Now, a violation of transaction records can result in a fine of $100 per person per violation. An intent to see or use health information for personal gain can lead, can lead to a fine of $250,000 or a prison term of no more than 10 years. Inappropriate disclosure can lead to a fine of $50,000 and or one year in prison. Now, PHI stands for Protected Healthcare Information and includes, but it's not limited to, names, addresses, employers, relatives' names, DOB, which is date of birth, telephone and fax numbers, email, and social security numbers. Now let's talk about some HIPAA compliance training. Decoding HIPAA, are you ready? Now there are three types of HIPAA communication, written, verbal, and electric. We touched on these earlier, but let's go over them again. 
Written has to do with anything that's personal information of the patient being exposed or seen uh, to the public. For example, insurance information, date of birth, why they're being seen by the doctor. We should not have out in the open uh, John Doe, date of birth, uh, herpes slash fever or anything that has to do with the patient's uh, personal information or medical records. Now verbal is the same thing. We should not be speaking verbally about a patient's symptoms or conditions uh, either by name or exposing any per personal information verbally where anybody around could hear. And of course we talked about electric where dealing with communications between two uh, different health agencies going back and forth with emails and attachments and so forth. And remember Faxing is not considered electric documents. So if you use a fax machine, that's not considered a part of electric documentation. So again, we have three types of HIPAA communication, written, verbal, and electric. So let's talk about treatment schedules. They should not be placed in the public's view. This includes the treatment rooms and reception areas and common areas where non-employees may see them. Again, this is a HIPAA violation. Now, patient's charts. Patient charts should not be left in outside holders on treatment doors. All pull charts should not be left in open reception or common office areas. Again, this is a HIPAA violation. Fax machines. Faxes are not considered electric communication. Faxes fall under written communication rules. Fax machines in enclosed areas should not be visible by non-employees. Now, transfer files. A provider must make sure only necessary information is transferred. This can be done using transcription services. Provider must ensure the service can keep all transferred information secure. Outside services must abide by HIPAA regulations. A business associate agreement is required for outside transcription services. For notice of privacy practices, providers must have patients sign acknowledgement and provider must retain the receipt. Storage and paper information. Provider must ensure the written information is protected and stored properly. Locking file cabinets are the most common safeguards for files and records. Limiting shared information. Providers must ensure LSI, limiting shared information. Only allow limited individuals to have access to confidential information and may need to limit physical access to certain parts of the office. Now with verbal information, some examples are phone conversations and office discussion. Phone conversations. Receptionists must be aware of any non-office personnel. Be extra cautious when using cell phones and avoid office conversations where personal patient information is being discussed. You don't know who's around and who's listening. We don't want to be discussing patients' uh, illnesses, diagnosis, personal information, who they are, or anything that can be heard by non-employees or non-office personnel. Now, electronic communication. Each provider must have a system in place to maintain security electronic, which consists of emails, computer billing, computer files. Now, restrict computer access by use of passwords, screen savers, screen shields, and logging off. And finally, secure all emails in the office setting. This includes laptops and PDAs, maintenance and update, updated software, and of course, daily backup of files. Now, how to protect patient privacy. Ask yourself, do I need to know this for my job? Now, do not pass information you are privileged to have onto anyone else without appropriate authority. When in doubt, ask a HIPAA officer. Now, when can you use disclosed PHI? Remember, PHI equals personal health information. For treatment, payment, and healthcare operations, with authorization or agreement from the individual. And of course, for use as a physician talking to a patient in a private room. And finally, there will be times when there will be reasons to release without authorization, possibly to state health agencies, the FDA, reporting child abuse, police or criminal justification, under a court order, and of course reporting deaths and crime victims. 
the end and thank you for watching volume 2 of phlebotomy solutions video series this is the end of volume 2 please continue on to volume 3